Okay, <clears throat> good afternoon. So you can hear me, right? Somebody say something if you can't hear me. Yeah. Okay, all right, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, we want to continue our discussion today of what's called the Z2 spin liquid. Uh, just a quick reminder. So the cartoon picture we have of uh, this uh, liquid um, is that you have a, um, a bunch of valence bonds. You can think of them as valence bonds uh, between electrons, which have opposite spins, forming a spin singlet. Or you can think of it as a boson, uh, which is at half filling. And in each valence bond, the boson is in the superposition state uh, of the two sides. So then not only does the boson form a superposition between two sides, that's like a single particle superposition, uh, the ground state is a superposition of many different rearrangements uh, of these uh, valence bonds or uh, hopping bosons. And once you allow for this kind of ground state, you end up with uh, some remarkable features. Um, you have an excitation called the spin-on, uh, which has boson number one half. Uh, each spin-on carries half of the original boson. Uh, when measured respect to the ground state. Uh, and then you have these visons, which are vortex-like defects. Uh, oh gosh, why is this not showing up? <laughs> oh, it's not moving. Sorry, oh, you haven't seen anything, okay. All right, start again. Oh. Right, okay, so this is the, the half boson moving in a background of singlets. And then you have a vison, which is a vortex-like defect also in the background of singlets. And from these, the existence of these properties, you can uh, work out uh, by some reasoning that took people many years to, to, to figure out. Uh, but now it's all very nicely summarized uh, in these set of uh, topological properties. Okay, so any questions on on what I've said so far and what's on the screen right now? Okay. So you know, excuse me. Yes, go spin, ahead. Spin spin on must be a boson. Uh, it can be, uh, there are two types of spin-ons, the E and the epsilon particle. Uh, and as it says here, the- Boson uh, of fermion, no problem. Okay. Yeah, the E we call, traditionally, we call the boson an E and the epsilon is the fermion. Okay. Thank you. Uh, right. Okay. Uh, so what we're going to do today uh, is obtain these properties uh, by just turning the crank. So that is, suppose I uh, I applied the methods you've learned so far, uh, when we, in particular, the methods we learned for superconductivity. What did we learn for superconductivity? Well, we said uh, you had a bunch of electrons, you assume they're initially uh, nearly free, but then they uh, uh, pair up. So you introduce this uh, pairing order parameter, the Cooper pair order parameter, the field psi, and then you did a mean field theory for psi, and then you did a theory of fluctuations of psi by integrating out the electrons and getting the Landau-Ginzburg theory for psi. And from that theory, you also understood the presence of vortices and the Meissner effect and all kinds of things. So, so we want to take that same recipe and apply it to a more complicated model uh, and see if what we get. Um, now, the way I'm going to present it, it's going to be full of uncontrolled steps, and, and that's why it wasn't totally clear what you had to do. Uh, but benefit of sight, I'm just going to take you what you should have done if you were smart enough and could have been done by somebody you know, a long, long time ago, but it took the community a while to uh, develop the understanding and how it fits into uh, this more algebraic perspective on what topological phases are. All right, so let's then start uh, the 
what's called the Schwinger boson theory. So we're going to take the same model, uh, spins on the square or triangular lattice. Uh, and I'll end up using the spin language more today than, uh, than the boson language, but I'll try to use both as much as I can. Uh, so the essence of the model, uh, both models, is that on each state, on each side, you have two states. You have a qubit in modern language. We call, you can call it spin up, spin down. Oops, or you can say uh, it's a boson present and boson absent. This is the boson capital boson B. All right, so what we're going to do right away uh, is fractionalize the boson. So we're going to say, uh, let's just assert uh, that there are bosons of half a charge. And we're going to need to have two of them. Uh, and I'm going to call those bosons S up uh, and S down. And they will end up having half a charge, uh, a boson number. And the way you do that is just by saying that uh, uh, the spin up, I'm going to say, is the presence of uh, uh, up boson, and spin down is the presence of a down boson. And these bosons act on some fictitious vacuum that has nothing to do with the ground state. It's just the vacuum of these half charged bosons, which are so far fictitious. Okay, so then, so these are the only physical states. So I have a constraint locally. Uh, that the number of up bosons and the number of down bosons should be one on every side. Yes? Okay. Um, so, so what is the spin operator in terms of these up and down bosons? Well, it's something very simple. And a spin operator you can think of as an operator that rotates between these two states. Uh, and that's just exactly the operator you would write down if these bosons were, were actual electrons. It's just the spin of these bosons on each side i, sigma alpha beta of the poly matrices. And these are just canonical bosons with the canonical uh, commutation relations. Uh, okay. Uh, and in terms of the uh, uh, this boson capital B, you know, we knew that boson B was uh, well, B dagger uh, was S plus. Uh, and that's, of course, the raising operator from this, from this representation. You can see it's basically S dagger up, S down. So what we see is that if I think of the S down boson uh, as carrying boson number minus a half, you know, I remember this relation also uh, uh, between B dagger B and S Z. We also had this relation before from yesterday. S Z is equal to B dagger B uh, minus a half. So from this relation, we can see uh, that uh, the spin up state, which where the left hand side is one half, is the state where B dagger B has to be equal to one, um, sorry, sorry, no, yes, is this correct? Yeah, okay, that's fine. As C is B dagger B minus a half, okay. Uh, so now what we see is that uh, on the other hand, S Z is also, yeah, this is what I wanted to write, uh, is uh, one half times S dagger up times S up, minus S dagger down, S down. So we see by comparing this expression between B dagger B and uh, S dagger up, S and this one here, that if I add, if I add an up boson, B dagger B increases by one half. Uh, and if I remove an S, boson, S down boson, B dagger B again increases by half. So this tells me that the S down boson has boson number minus a half, and the S up boson has boson number plus a half. So then this, this operator turns out to have boson number one, because you remove a boson, a boson number minus a half and add a boson, boson number plus a half, okay? So, so these are bosons, these are the, these bosons are eventually going to become the E particle. I mean, this is how we are kind of proceeding. Uh, we just inserting, just writing on each side, 
things in terms of these, what we hope will eventually become an e-particle that can run through the entire site uh, lattice. You know, of course, to get the e-particle in the discussion yesterday, it was very crucial that we had this liquid of valence bonds floating around. It can't happen on a single site. It really requires very complicated entanglement and correlations between all the spins. Okay. And as an aside, I just noticed that you could also do this for a spin S where you had two S plus one states on each side by just generalizing this constraint here to this one. But we won't do that uh, in the lecture, it's in the notes. Okay, so, so one thing we can very easily work out from uh, these bosons, this representation, you just take this representation and you hit, put it into S1 dot S2. Uh, and then you rearrange terms, you use a lot of identities, and I assure you that you can then rewrite it uh, in this way. Okay, that is epsilon alpha beta is the anti-symmetric tensor here. So curly epsilon uh, is the tensor zero, one, minus one, zero. And alpha beta go over up and down. So, so this particular combination here uh, is basically creates a singlet because it's S dagger up, S down. So, so you know, if you write this out in, uh, in its full, full flow rate, uh, this is just one over root two, uh, S one uh, dagger up, and then S two dagger down minus S dagger one down, S dagger two up, acting on the vacuum. So that's basically, of course, nothing but up, down, uh, minus down, up, the famous singlet between the two spins. Okay, so this this particular operator then, um, you can see, annihilates a singlet and this creates it. So this is just a projection into singlets. And so now you can kind of easily check this identity. So you know, you know the eigenvalues of this operator. Uh, this operator has eigenvalues minus three quarters in a singlet uh, and plus one quarter in the triplet. I presume you've all seen that at some point. Uh, or is that right? Uh, yeah, so that, wait a second now. So then this expression is not right, one second. <laughs> uh, so if I have a triplet, uh, that should have value of minus a quarter or it should be plus a quarter. Uh, let me quickly cheat. Okay, so there's some some uh, error here, but it won't matter. It's only a question of this constant being off. Uh, yeah, that doesn't look right. Okay, let me just quickly look up my notes. Excuse me. <laughs> uh, okay. Um, Minus a half. Oh yeah, okay. So that should be minus a half of that. It should be minus a half. Okay. Well, okay, it's not quite the projection operator, I suspect. Yeah. Uh, so that should be a plus a quarter. Yeah. Okay. So when this is a singlet, when this is a triplet, this gives you zero. This first term here gives you zero. So the value is one quarter. Uh, and and when it's a singlet, then uh, this should all okay. There's probably a minus this so minus a half plus a quarter is minus a quarter. Uh, so the, but this actually gives you two when you hit it on this date. Uh, so, so it's minus one plus a quarter, which is minus three quarters. Okay. So this uh, of course you should just verify this uh, just by you take this and insert this in here and rearrange, and that's the answer. Okay. So we're going to use that identity, uh, uh, and it's very useful because this is this is telling us something nice uh, that really what if you want to create singlet bonds, uh, you want to give this operator an expectation value, just like in a superconductivity where you wanted to create a uh, Cooper pair, you wanted to give an expectation value of C up C down. Yeah, I want to create a singlet bond, uh, and that's also you can think of as a Cooper pair, not really Cooper, but as a pair of the bosons. So we're going to pair these bosons up. 
but between different sites. We're going to pair a boson on site one with a boson on site two. Clearly, the, the, the analogy with superconductivity is very, very uh, close. All right, so we just take our very simple Hamiltonian here, SI dot SJ, uh, and then use this Schwinger boson representation to write an exact path integral for it. So this is the exact path integral. So there's various things, various terms here. Let me explain them all. Uh, this is the usual uh, kin uh, kinematic term, which are for the any boson. So you for every boson, both the up and the down boson, uh, you have the usual kinematic term. Then you have the Hamiltonian itself, uh, which is right here. Uh, and here I'm just using, in fact, uh, this representation. And I guess I forgot a factor of two there to get it right. Um, so it should be a factor of two here, I suppose. If, uh, I, I, okay, I'll have to check that again. So the notes that I have, I have it. Yeah, no, there is a factor of two, correct, even in my notes. So that's this term. That's just the Hamiltonian. And this tells you have bosons. And finally, and most crucially, uh, is the fact that these are not free bosons. Even, even when they were born, they were strongly interacting. Uh, even without a Hamiltonian, there was this constraint. So you impose that constraint uh, with a Lagrange multiplier. So you have a, a Lagrange multiplier lambda on every site, which is also a function of time. Uh, and we do the integral over lambda, it gives you a delta function in the path integral where S dagger S minus is, is one. Okay. All right, so any questions? So you have, everyone understand this? This is just the same problem written out uh, with no approximations. Okay, uh, it's not fully obvious yet, but it will be even more obvious in a minute. Uh, this theory is actually a gauge theory. It's a lattice gauge theory. It's got a huge degree of symmetry. Uh, and and so this integral, you know, is highly redundant. In other words, when I'm doing this integral, there's lots of different values of these fields where the action uh, or the Lagrangian has this exactly the same value. Uh, so that's some kind of very flat regions in this huge uh, functional space. Uh, and you know, but this is a, on a lattice. There's no there's no infinities as such. Um, and so you can just integrate over those flat directions and not not. Uh, worry too much. But if you're on the continuum, you would have to worry about all these very flat directions, uh, which would give you lots of infinities to worry of to, to control. Fortunately, that's a lot easier to deal with here. Okay. So now we are going to do exactly what we did in superconductivity. We took we take the pairing operator. This is the pairing of two bosons uh, and decouple it by Hubbard Stranovich field. But here it's very crucial we do everything on, on the lattice uh, and on bond by bond. For every bond, we have a pairing field. Uh, and that's because of the, the gauge invariance. Uh, if you, you really have to keep track of that extremely carefully. So we're going to decouple this term by Hubbard Stanovich transformation. So I introduce another field Q on every bond, uh, which just decouples this. So Lagrangian, these these terms I already had. These this term on each this is exactly the same as that, written a little differently now with the lambda i uh, coupled with the d by d tau, and then this Hamiltonian uh, has been decoupled to uh, to this term over here, to this term. So here we have q i j squared over two q i j star on the Annihilation of a pair of bosons on different on a pair of nearest neighbor sites. That should be a J. So that's a J there and another J there. Okay. Um, so there's a there's a bosons between sites I and J who are going to couple to this bond field QIJ. It's a complex number QIJ on every link of the lattice and for all times tau. So this is, as you can see, it's very much analogous to the superconducting order parameter, except, <clears throat> uh, 
We did that by pairing electrons in momentum space, but here we prefer to carefully work in real space. <clears throat> okay. And now if you, you can, again, do the integral over Q, uh, you get back to the original Hamiltonian. You do the integral over lambda, you impose the constraint, and you're back to the original Hamiltonian then, just S1 dot S2. Uh, and of course, the trick is we're going to invert the integrations. We're going to do the integration of S first, uh, rather than Q and lambda. That's the usual thing with all of these things, uh, including the theory of superconductivity, the analog of S or the electrons themselves. Okay, but now the most important property of the of the Lagrangian that did wasn't present for superconductivity, and this almost seems like you know too close to superconductivity for comfort. We know this system is not a superconductor. So why is that? Well, the most important property of this theory uh, is that it has a gauge symmetry. Uh, and I urge you to just check the following statement. Suppose I perform a gauge transformation in, in which uh, these S bosons for both spins are rotated by some phase factor, rho sub i of tau. So this is the quantity generating my gauge transformation. It's some real field rho, uh, which is periodic up to two pi because it's up in the exponential. Uh, I is the site and time is the tau, tau is the time. Yes, question? Oh, yes. Just want to make sure. I think it's certainly clear, but I think just to be clear for everyone. So the uh, the variable in the past integral written in the action, those field should be, yes, should be in the representation or something. I think it's, it, the S is in the representation of SU2. Is that correct? It's a two uh, in the S. The R, well, R5, uh, uh, I mean, uh, double it. There is a global, there is a global SU2 symmetry in the Hamiltonian I wrote down. Uh, but you, this general, you don't really need that. You, you could work, everything will work without actually any symmetry. I just use SU2 symmetry just because that's a common physical situation. You don't need that symmetry. So S is just, SI alpha is a complex number on every side uh, and F or spin up and down for all time tau. QIJ is a complex number uh, on each, uh, on each link of the lattice. And lambda is a real number on each side of the lattice. Although pretty soon we're gonna deform the lambda integral uh, in the complex plane to reach a saddle point. But right now we're thinking of lambda as a real number because only when it's a real number does this constraint get imposed. Uh, just make sure, but the way we write this epsilon alpha beta, S alpha, S beta, neglect the side index, ij, this is uh, uh, two, two times two of SU2 paired with into the one, a singular, correct? Correct, correct, correct. We we yeah, are not worried, we are not worried about yeah. like triple uh, three, but we can probably also do that for maybe a more complicated. Yeah, uh, no, no, the, you can. We don't want to basically we don't want to condense the triplet because you want to condense valence bond. But there are triplet excitations in the theory. We haven't thrown them out. You know, as I said, if you go back here, this was an exact representation of S one dot S two. So you can act on this by a triplet, and you get the right answer. You can act it on by a singlet, and you also get the right answer. This isn't just a, a rewriting. I've chosen to rewrite it this way. I could equally well have chosen to rewrite it by projecting onto triplets. I just don't do that because that's not the phase I'm interested in. Yes. Okay. Very clear. Thank you. And Q is a, a complex Q. Yeah. Q is, complex. is uh, that's complex. right. Because this is a singlet under it's global a... SU2. No problem. Singlet. Yes. Okay, so but the, I, uh, yes. Sorry, what's the reason for the I uh, multiplying lambda in the Hamann? Uh... Okay, this is not the site index I, this is the square root of minus one. Uh, that's because only then is this a delta function. I'm just using the identity, uh, uh, you know, dx uh, e to the I x a is just delta of a. So there has to be an I there for that to be true. With some two pi's that we are ignoring. Okay. Thank you. 
yeah, I'm, yeah, that, that confusion is be present in many of my expressions. Sometimes the I refers to the square root of minus one, uh, and sometimes it refers to the site, I'm sorry, but I think it's very, it should be clear if it's sitting out here in an expression, it's square root of minus one. If it's a subscript, it's the site, okay? The I as the site label won't ever appear in in the Hamiltonian on its own. If, if it is actually, a, I need the site position, I'll call it R sub I or X sub I or Y sub I. Okay. Right, so same confusion here. This is the square root of minus one. This is the subscript for the site label. So I make a gauge transformation of the boson on each site. Uh, and then you can easily see just by looking at this uh, that this is gauge invariant provided I also change QIJ. Uh, and it has to have one factor of rho I from site I and another from site J. So it has a, it's not a kind of thing you've met before really probably. It's, it's an object which has a non-local, you know, it's sitting on a bond. So it cares about the gauge transformation on both its ends. So it seems to be going from one side to the other. Uh, as you'll see, it has a character for gauge field. So eventually the phase of QIJ in some cases will become something like a gauge field. Uh, although the, right now there's no gauge field in the theory. There's only a gauge invariance. We don't have a, okay. And then finally, if you make this transformation uh, uh, time dependent, then, uh, then this term, this d by d tau will give you a contribution, but you can cancel that by a gauge transformation of lambda uh, by transforming lambda by the time derivative. Now this looks like very much like a gauge transformation uh, of, a, of a gauge field where lambda is looking like the time component of a gauge field. And that's indeed what happens in certain phases of uh, that we're going to find. Uh, the Lagrange multiplier of the constraint becomes a time component of a gauge field. Getting the spatial component is often much more subtle. Uh, the time component is completely straightforward. All right, so there is this huge gauge symmetry here when we do the integral, uh, meaning that if I make this transformation, the action doesn't change. So there's a, you know, in the parameter space, there's some directions along which the action has the same value. So, so if you integrate along those directions, if nothing changes, you'll get an infinity uh, unless those directions are properly compact. So we have, sometimes we have to worry about that. Uh, normally the simplest way to do that is just fix a gauge. Say, okay, uh, if it's a flat direction, I'm only going to pick a point in every flat direction. That's the same as fixing a gauge. And a common gauge would be to just fix uh, lambda to be time dependent, independent. You can always choose rho. If you give me a lambda, I can choose rho to make the new lambda time independent. I can always do that. Uh, I guess, what is that? That's called the Landau gauge, maybe I forget. Uh, on the Coulomb gauge. No, that's not the Coulomb gauge. I think it's the Landau gauge. Anyway, so that's the gauge choice I can make. And then once I make that gauge choice, the integral is perfectly well defined uh, because the other directions are, uh, are up in the phase. And so, so the, these gauge transformations never give you an infinite, the infinity to worry about. They're compact. They just they can run from zero to two pi. So here, yes. So here is the subtlety that uh, e to the i rho should be should be should be should be should be, should be periodic over tau when we shift tau to tau plus beta. So correct, correct. Yes. And can you can can, can you always choose rho to make lambda constant? Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, good point. Sometimes you can't. <laughs> Yeah, so they, they, this, yeah, thank you. <laughs> I misstated. So there, there can be windings of lambda that you worry about. But at zero temperature, uh, you don't have to worry about it. At finite temperature, that's an issue. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to come back. This, this is going to be a crucial role in everything, this gauge transformation. But right now, we're just going to ignore it. Yes, go on. Uh, here you do the transformation for every site i the spin s only uh, fix the flavor okay. alpha and then change to the same spin s alpha but we can also rotate the alpha alpha beta by introducing 
don't want to no, do that, it. Here. That, you absolutely no. do not want to do that, uh, at least in this particular theory. Uh, I should also say here, when you make this transformation, you can easily check that the uh, spin operator on the site that's been capital large S goes to is gauge invariant. It doesn't change. And it doesn't change precisely because uh, this is not dependent on alpha. If I do the transformation here, uh, right here, I'm I'm chasing uh, the S by S or S independent of beta and S dagger by the same phase, so it just cancels out. So the physical operator, any any actual operator, which is the spin operator, everything I can make is built out of the spin operator or the capital B boson operator. Any observation I can make is some composite of that. All observations, all physical operators, any physical observable uh, should have this trivial transformation under gauge symmetry. So nothing physical has any gauge charge. Is is always gauge in, yeah, anything physical is gauge invariant. And that's a fundamental characteristics of what we, you know, emergent gauge fields that we're going to find here. All right, but that's really probably for next lecture. Uh, for now, yeah, okay, there's some gauge symmetry. So let's just say at the back of my mind, uh, just keep it at the back of my mind, but just fix a gauge, you know. I mean, which is what you do in condensed matter physics all the time. Even the electromagnetism has a gauge symmetry, but we say, oh no, we just pick a gauge and we throw out uh, uh, the photon because the velocity of light is infinity. Uh, and we just fix the gauge and you work with some electrostatic potential in the Coulomb interaction and end of story, we never worry about the gauge. Usually, except you know when we talked about the every cost of vortices, we did have to bring it in uh, occasionally. And here we'll find the same thing and uh, to some extent, we're just going to forget the gauge, do some mean field theory, and then uh, and then go back and think about gauge invariance for again. Okay. So basically, what we're going to do exactly in the theory of superconductivity uh, is we are going to do a mean field theory, which in which we just make Q and lambda constants. Uh, certainly independent of time, lambda also independent of space, uh, and Q uh, will have some subtle but weak dependence on, on the links, but mostly it will be independent of them. So we're just going to take a saddle point, basically. We look for a saddle point between Q and lambda uh, while we integrate over the S. And this is, you know, this whole procedure by now should be clear to you uh, from what we did for the Boson-Hubbard model. It's completely equivalent to just starting with the original Hamiltonian uh, without even using path integrals uh, and just doing a, a, a factorization and looking for the mean best mean field solution. Uh, and I'll just, you know, we can obtain that from the path integral now, or we can obtain it from the Bose-Hubbard model, from, from the factorization procedure. We did both for the Bose-Hubbard model, but now hopefully you've internalized it and are happy to just do it in one way and proceed. Okay, so we're just going to replace Q and lambda by a constant uh, and then look for the saddle point of the path integral. Okay. So it turns out, that at the saddle point, you have to make lambda complex. The only then you get a meaningful saddle point. So what this means, uh, what do you mean by complex lambda? How does that make any sense? So I said the lambda integral, this is the lambda plane, uh, is lambda must be real. But imagine that there's a complex plane here. This is the complex lambda plane. So we are doing the integral along the contour here, but we're gonna deform the contour a little bit. Uh, and this will be our saddle point, and then go back down. So we, it turns out that the saddle point is off the contour, which is not an uncommon thing when you do path integral, when you do ordinary integrals uh, in the uh, of variables. So the saddle point will be there. Um, and so at the saddle point, the value we're going to call that uh, lambda bar. In fact, it's minus psi lambda bar, sorry. So lambda bar is a real number. So I lambda is going to be a real number, which will actually turn out to be positive. So I didn't, uh, okay, I got to fix that then. Oops. Uh, uh, 
Yeah, lambda goes that way. Okay, so that's <laughs> then lambda bar is positive. Okay. All right, so then the mean field equations are completely equivalent to the following Hamiltonian. So you just take the Hamiltonian for the Qs. Uh, basically, you take uh, this, this is our Hamiltonian. Uh, and then I have this lambda term, but I lambda becomes lambda bar. Uh, and I have S dagger S. So they therefore, and I just, this is just a constant as far as the S bosons are concerned. So for the, uh, I have a mean field Hamiltonian. This is very much like the Cooper pair Hamiltonian. I have these numbers Q, I, Q bar IJ, which I'm allowing to depend on site for now. And even I'm allowing lambda bar to depend on the site I but not on time. Uh, uh, and this is the complex conjugate and basically, so that's my Hamiltonian for pairing the, the, the S bosons. Uh, the diff big difference from the, you know, it's very much like the PCS Hamiltonian, uh, except that the pairing is in real space and not momentum space. And there's no kinetic energy term. In fact, the kinetic energy term of the boson is just a uh, constant. Uh, so the, that's because the bosons, you know, were restricted to be on one side, but now we're going to kind of allow them to move around uh, with the QIJ. With this, on this QIJ is the thing that's going to allow these S bosons to go from being just on one side to become spin-ons that can go through the lattice. Okay, so that's the mean field Hamiltonian. And what are the mean field equations? Well, one way to get the mean field equation is just take the saddle point value. So if I take d by d lambda here of the action, I get a mean field equation. d by d lambda of the action gives me s dagger s equals one. So, <clears throat> so there's one equation that's the that I have to satisfy. And then if I take d by d q of this action, d by d q would give me a q star here. And this would give me that. So that has to equal zero. And so then I get the other mean field equation um, that Q star or take a complex conjugate Q bar is equal to this. Uh, and you can see now that actually I could have gotten, you know, the original Hamiltonian if I wrote the original Hamiltonian down. Uh, let's see if let me do this on a piece of paper. So the, the quickest way to get this uh, is not the long winded way I've taken uh, because uh, um, where was I? Yeah. Because I want we want to do more than just do mean field theory, of course. Uh, there's a bug here. Okay, so I have a, the original Hamiltonian, ignoring factors of two that I probably won't get right, was minus j over two. I'll just pick one bond here. Forget the sum over ij. Uh, it was epsilon alpha beta. S dagger I alpha S dagger J beta times uh, something like this. Uh, and, and basically, this uh, we write approximately in the usual mean field theory as minus j over 2, the expectation value of this guy and this term here, minus j over 2 times so that term over there. And then I have this term on its own in here and the expectation value of that term. Okay, so you just factorize one times the other. So this is how you do mean field theory. And if you just did that, you would indeed get exactly the Hamiltonian uh, along with these sub, these uh, mean field equations. And then you add a Lagrange multiplier to oppose the constraint that S dagger S equals one, uh, and then you get this extra term here. Okay. So that's the saddle point of that Hamiltonian, which had a gauge symmetry, but we're just ignoring it. So now our task is to just solve these equations. You, so the, it's the same, that we did for uh, the Bose Hubbard model. Uh, here, you pick a QIJ on every bond, uh, you pick a lambda on every bond, you find the ground state energy of this Hamiltonian, uh, and then, and also compute the expectation value of QIJ 
and uh, S dagger S in the Hamiltonian. And then you see if these equations are obeyed. Uh, if they're not, you keep iterating. Uh, and you know, so that requires a computer. And in this case, when I was much younger, I actually solved these equations laboriously uh, on various lattices. Uh, and I can tell you what the answers are. So the answers turn out to be very simple, but these are now actual true statements that I personally checked, but others have done also in many different cases. So, but hopefully you get the principle of it. It's just really very much like a canonical Hartree-Fock mean field theory uh, of interacting bosons in this case. And the reason I didn't do it just as a Hartree-Fock is here, it's absolutely crucial to understand the fluctuations and that one can only do uh, cleanly with the path integral approach. Okay, everyone with me? Um, I have a quick question. In that HMF, should yeah. we have like a QIJ bar squared term? Uh, it's independent of the S. So <clears throat> if you want to compute the energy, yes, that's correct. So let me just say there's a, uh, there's a ground sum energy E0 of Q, right? So in this case, we know what it is. It's just exactly this term, absolutely. But it's not important for determining the saddle point. So you pick, you know, once you, in determining the values of Q and lambda, you have to iterate this equation with this equation. And you can just keep doing that. You don't, the constant makes no difference. <clears throat> Where the constant becomes important uh, is one, when you do the fluctuations, we'll have to worry about it. Uh, and two, if you have two different saddle points and you want to compare their energy, see which one is better, you have to include that constant. But that's in the next step. For now, we don't need it. Yeah, but thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. So the answer, <clears throat> say on the square lattice, it turns out to be very simple. Uh, you have, uh, <clears throat> you find that Q is basically a constant, the same on every link. But one thing you have to keep in mind is that by the by very definition, by even this definition, you can see uh, that this QIJ is an odd, odd under its indices. QIJ is minus QJI. <coughs> so I have to give it an orientation. So when I tell you the value of Q, I have to tell you, am I telling you about QIJ or am I telling you about QJI? Um, so I can represent that pictorially by just drawing some arrows. So if you just take every horizontal bond, uh, you always put small, the left index first and the second index, uh, right index second, uh, QI I plus X and QI I plus one. Then a particular, then of the lowest energy solution has this Q, Q equals Q bar and lambda equals lambda bar independent of I. Uh, and you can you know run the computer and get the values of lambda bar and Q bar um, by just solving these equations. Okay, uh, you could also get other values, uh, but what I can assert with some confidence uh, is that any other value that you find will be related to these values by a gauge transformation. You can always do a gauge transformation of any solution because you already know any gauge transform solution has to have the same energy. It is the same. So you can, so this is a have once I choose this, this value in a sense, I've, Picked a gauge. Then you know, I can always choose my gauge for this equal to Q bar. We'll come back to that later. Okay, so now I can just put this Q bar in here. I have my value of Q bar. I have a Hamiltonian. I can take a Fourier transform of this, write this in momentum space. It's just a quadratic Hamiltonian for nearest neighbor antiferromagnet on the square lattice. Uh, and this is what you get. Uh, you get, now it's starting to look even more like BCS. Uh, you have, in BCS, you have CK up and C minus K down. And that's exactly like the pairing, that's exactly what you have here. It's spin singlet pairing of these bosons, just like BCS was spin singlet pairing of electrons. Uh, but then there's this momentum dependent factor. 
it comes from the anti-symmetry. You know, when you take account is epsilon alpha beta, you end up getting a sign. Uh, and in fact, it's imaginary. You get sine kx plus sine ky and sine kx plus sine ky. So this is a, well, an interesting difference from Cooper pairing, but it's not unknown in Cooper pairing. If you look at this, think of this as a Cooper pair wave function uh, in momentum space, it's sort of like a, it's a P wave wave function, you know. If, at least for small k, it's just kx, and small k is ky. That's that's a p wave. Uh, it's sine of kx. And well, that's because everything has to be periodic. So, I mean, p p p wave and d waves only make sense in infinite space. On a lattice, you have more complicated things called b one g and a one g and all this nonsense, which I can never remember. But it's one of those. It's the one that has looks like p wave in the continuum. So you might say, well, wait a minute, uh, how come I got a P wave? Well, that's because they're bosons. So uh, when you form a Cooper pair, if for electrons, if the electrons are spin singlet, uh, then the singlet is anti-symmetric on the exchange uh, of the spin. So they're just, this must mean the orbital part uh, for electrons must be symmetric under exchange of the orbital coordinates. So there must be S wave or D wave. So that's why spin singlet superconductors of electrons or fermions uh, have even parity. But for a boson, exchange of the two bosons should be symmetric. So if it's spin singlet, which is anti-symmetric, then the spatial part must also be anti-symmetric to make the whole thing symmetric. And that's why we have P wave. So really it's a theory of P wave pairing of bosons. Okay, but there's no superconductivity here or anything like it. Uh, there could be if you condense the boson, and that's because of the gauge symmetry, and that's what we're going to try to understand So, Okay, but anyway, uh, we don't worry about such subtleties. We're just looking at the free particle Hamiltonian. Uh, so we just diagonalize it, and by this time, you're hopefully oh, experts at this. You just take a boggly bulb transformation, and diagonalize the whole thing. All right, okay. So I won't write it out. There's um, you know, the usual U's and V's, and you, you've done this already in chapter one or chapter two when we talked about the Bowie Lebow theory of the Bose of the Bose gas. We had a very similar type of Hamiltonian, and so you'll get some new Bowie bonds uh, with some energy omega k, which you can work out uh, is equal to this. Okay. Uh, all right. So first thing you you can you will find when you do this is that the energy omega k is independent of spin, uh, and basically you always get a double degeneracy uh, where these gamma k carry a spin index uh, alpha. So the gamma k now are are excitations, uh, and as we discussed at the very beginning of the lecture, they carry boson number plus half or minus a half. So at the end of the story, I have a mean field Hamiltonian for this antiferromagnet. And what is telling me that my excitations are bosons that carry spin a half, uh, or bosons with boson number plus or minus a half with some dispersion. I even know the dispersion. This is what it looks like uh, right here. Okay, so this looks and smells very much like the E particle. That's exactly all the characteristics of the E particle. It's a spin I have object, uh, which is a boson. Uh, and uh, now we even have a dispersion. We actually have numbers as to what its energy is. Uh, you can also do the same thing on the triangle lattice, which is what we'll also need, unfortunately. It's not good enough to work on the square lattice for reasons we'll discuss shortly, okay? So on the triangle lattice, basically you do the same song and dance uh, and you get almost the same, you know, the same, the Q has the same magnitude on every bond, but you have to give it some orientation, which is shown in this picture here. Uh, and uh, instead of having sine KX plus sine KY, you have sine K1 plus sine K2 plus sine K3. Uh, and uh, and where k1, k2, k3 are components of k along these three directions. Okay. Uh, all right. 
And in fact, I actually have a plot of omega k here. So this is the plot of this is the actual dispersion of the spin-ons in momentum space. Uh, they have some minima at some point, uh, and uh, you know six-fold symmetry because you're on the triangle lattice and so on. Okay. All right. So uh, that all looks very good, uh, but of course we can't just declare victory and say we have found a z to spin liquid. We have to check many things. We have to uh, check that the saddle point is stable to fluctuations. We have to check, you have to find a Vison somewhere. That's what we were we were told that any Z to spin liquid has to have a Vison. So is there one here? Uh, and then we have to check that the Vison and the spin on have mutual statistics. All of these things we have to uh, we have to work out. Uh, and as I've already hinted, uh, yes, there is a Vison and it will be just like again by the analogy to theory of superconductivity. It will be just like the Abercross of vortex in this case, but it will have somewhat different properties than the Abercross of vortex. In fact, quite different, and that's because of the gate symmetry that you have to keep track of. The other thing we we will find uh, is that this whole procedure actually fails on the square lattice. It doesn't. It's not true that the square lattice, this solution that I've showed you which I'm hopefully optimistically saying is a Z2 spin liquid. In fact, it isn't. Uh, and what it is, well, that turns out to be much more complicated. And we, I'm not going to answer that now or in the, even the next week or two, but maybe towards the end of the course, we'll return to this very difficult problem, what happens to the square lattice. But for the triangle lattice, uh, it turns out that this uh, this solution that I've showed you is in fact a Z two spin liquid. It will then it'll it'll pass all the tests which we are going to impose on it. Okay, but that's uh, the discussion of the mean field theory so far. Any questions? Yes, do you yeah. need to check the self consistent conditions? Oh, uh, we've already done that. That's what I said. I didn't did numerically. I didn't go through it. Uh, but even these conditions here, these. It's, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, this. yeah. It's it's because of these conditions we can figure out get the values of Q bar and lambda bar. So that requires, you know, just you pick a Q bar and lambda bar, you you diagonalize this Hamiltonian. In the new Hamiltonian, you compute this. And then if they're not satisfied, you pick another one and you keep iterating until that's satisfied. So that requires a numerical procedure. Uh, I may even have computer programs somewhere uh, that do those things, and I, I, I assure that's been done, including by me and by many other people. And you can work out the values of lambda bar and q bar you know, for both the square and the triangle lattice, and and you get answers. You know that <laughs> that uh, by themselves doesn't tell you that there could be something wrong. Hey, Subir, is it obvious, uh, sorry if I missed this, but is it obvious why this state will have a lower energy than the Neil antiferromagnet? No, it's not at all obvious. Uh, yeah, but I think our point of view right now is that uh, this is just, a, this Hamiltonian is just a representative of some white class of Hamiltonians, and we're just trying to understand the qualitative structure of this mean field solution and its fluctuations. Yeah, and if you find a reasonable saddle point which passes all the tests, uh, then we'll be happy. But of course, then we have to check whether it's actually the lowest saddle point. But the hope is that there is some other Hamiltonian out there for which uh, this is the lowest. You know, whether this saddle point is lower or that is lower depends on all the details of the Hamiltonian. Right now, we're just the limited task of okay, let's find a saddle point and let's make sure in this region uh, it looks like a Z two spin liquid. Cool. Uh, and I had another question of, if you go to the case where you have long range interactions, does the spin on dispersion relation still remain analytic within the mean field uh, analysis? Uh, you can work it out it, up to the values of these uh, Q bars. There'll be many more Q bars to worry about, but it will have some form like this. I mean, it, it, would it be I mean, you're saying would it have singularities in momentum space? It could, if you're, if you're, sorry? 
sorry i was just i was just wondering if like somebody had already done that um like if, if, um, if people have asked like if jij goes like a power law and raj you know what how does this picture change in a uh, it won't change very much the numbers will change but uh you know uh, the basic analysis can still be done and in fact i think uh genuinely and Darshan are trying to do some of that right now for the Wittberg Adams situation. <laughs> cool. Thanks. Um, okay. All right. So let me just make actually uh, related to a question that came up. Uh, um, on the nail order. They, they, in fact, this particular solution does allow to have nail order. Uh, and 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 this is sort of what happens. So so when you solve for the values of Q and lambda, uh, sometimes you find uh, you know some regime maybe you can find a solution. But then you find at some point that uh, this minimum energy here becomes smaller and smaller and smaller until it hits zero. And when it hits zero, at that point. You know, you, it can't go negative. Bosons can't have a negative energy. The whole thing doesn't, wouldn't make any sense. So, and when a boson hits zero energy, you know what it does. It has to both condense. So these spin-ons will both condense. Uh, so there's a two types of solutions. Uh, one uh, in which omega k has a gap for all k solution A, which could be a Z to spin liquid. I should I should put a question mark there. Uh, or if you work this out. You get a solution in which uh, lambda bar and q bar adjust so that omega k uh, is zero, exactly zero for some special k. And for that solution to work, then you actually also have to condense the bosons. Uh, and this solution is, in fact, the nail state, the ordered antiferro magnet. Just a complicated way to describe it, but it gives you all the right properties. Um, I won't say more about this. It's uh, in the notes that are in the readings uh, about this, how you get the nail state out. But it's uh, it's just basically a limiting case where the gap vanishes and stays at zero, pinned at zero because the rest of the boson number is taken up by the condensate. And and that, that and that zero energy excitation here uh, just becomes a spin wave in that case, which is like a closed tone boson because you have broken spin rotation symmetry. So we're not interested in that phase. We're interested in the gap phase, uh, which is some kind of state that preserves all symmetries, even though you have bosons that are half filling, the original back half, it will be boson. Uh, and it seems to have excitations with a half boson number, which are also bosons. Okay, so I think that's a good point to stop because then the next, uh, next lecture will be fluctuations about mean field theory. <laughs> Now we've got a saddle point now to look at what happens around it uh, to make sure the saddle point makes sense. Okay, any more questions? I have, if it's okay. Uh, let me see if there's anybody else and then you can go. Anyone else? Um, yeah. Uh, you said the, the square lattice boson solution doesn't work, but uh, the fermion uh, solution would work, right? The fermion solution? Uh, yeah, like the, the pi flux. Yeah. Uh, okay, if you just shrink the fermions, which you can, good point, I haven't talked about that and we will use that later. Uh, yeah, if you took, so with shrinker fermions, it turns out that the analog of the QIJ uh, have a flux, that's what your thing is referring to. Uh, yeah, the solution is there, much like the bosons. I mean, you will find a solution to the equation, even for bosons or fermions. Uh, uh, but what is the case that uh, for both bosons and fermions, it's not a Z2, Z2 spin liquid, it's something else. So we, we're not, we're going to defer discussion of that. I, I'm right trying to, when I say it doesn't work, what I mean is simply that it's not a Z2 spin liquid. Not that the saddle point is meaningless. Oh, okay. Yeah. Thank you. So because, you know, these bosons and firm, the, the bosons can't hop. They're like fixed to one site. Why does it matter if we choose bosons or fermions? Yeah. Uh, yeah, you can choose either, right? It's just a matter of, I mean, 
So what? So it, the formalism allows you to choose these these s particles to be either bosons or fermions. I just chose chose bosons uh, because actually some of the equations are a bit simpler for them, uh, and uh, you could have chosen them to be fermions. So what will happen in the end is that if you find a zeta spin liquid. Uh, we know a zeta spin liquid has spin-ons, the E and the epsilon spin-ons particles. Okay. So in the end, you'll uh, end up describing the same state of matter in two different ways. Uh, in one way, which is what we're taking right now, the lattice uh, particle, the boson, uh, is itself related in a simple way to the actual E particle. And that relationship is what we've just described. But there will also be a Vison somewhere, and then, then my epsilon particle will be a bound state of the of the S boson and the Vison. On the other hand, uh, I could have started with let's call them F fermions, uh, which carry boson, which carry spin S Z equals one half, or boson number half. Right, those are fermions carrying boson number half. That's possible. So that's allowed. You could do it that way. Uh, and then those fermions are directly related by a similar theory to the epsilon particles. And then the E particle will be a bound state of the epsilon particle on the Vison. So you can do either route, and I will do the other route later in the course. Uh, and then there's some, some rather involved symmetry analysis uh, to show that either both routes, you know, to, to, to see that which particular boson saddle point corresponds to which particular fermion saddle point and, and ends up describing the same state, at least topologically. Uh, so there's ways of figuring that out. And uh, there were papers by one of my former students, Yang Chi and Shiba Yu and Julia, who worked through some of that and many others. I think Ashwin also has written many papers on that issue. Uh, that's quite complicated and technical. Uh, but yeah, so the short answer to your comment is that you could use either. Uh, eventually, you can end up with the same set of states. It turns out that the fermion formulation is actually more powerful, but I've deferred it. I haven't used it here because it's a little more complicated and it raises issues that I don't want to deal with right now. Uh, okay. I see. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Juven. I can wait, no worry. If you can. Nobody else, so go ahead. <laughs> okay, let me see. A couple of questions already asked, but let, let me make sure. So uh, doing both on square lattice and triangular lattice, do we all find the superconductivity or have a P wave pairing? Is it chiral P wave? Yeah. I, I, no, uh, it's not superconductivity. At least it's absolutely not. It, this pairing, you can think of the pairing as just singlet bond formation. I mean, it's, this is no more than that, okay? And these singlet bonds resonate. They don't actually move, as you saw. For a singlet bond to move, it has to find another singlet bond, and they can resonate. It can't just move on its own. Uh, and, and that's why it's never superconductive. And that's very much related to the gauge, the gauge invariance of the theory that the single bond can't really move, it has to exchange another single bond. Uh, and that that fact is what's encoded by the gauge symmetry. So 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 there is no global U1 symmetry that's broken by this pair condensate. So this QIJ, putting Q bar I, you know, QIJ equals Q bar doesn't break a global symmetry. That's why it's not a superconductor. So just making an answer is that Q Q is equal to Q bar, which is constant, it does not give you a superconductor because there is no Q bar or Q doesn't carry any global uh, U1 charge. Unlike in superconductivity, where there's a global symmetry of fermion number conservation, uh, which is broken by the Cooper pair. Of course, you could say that even in superconductivity, uh, there is electromagnetism, and there is no global symmetry there. It's gauged by, electro by physical electromagnetism. And if you said that, then I would agree with you that even superconductivity doesn't break uh, <laughs> doesn't break a gauge symmetry. 
but let's keep things simple right now and just think of ordinary electromagnetism as, as an unimportant and electrons have a global symmetry, whereas these Schwinger particles, these S particles do not have a global symmetry. But there's still some P wave pairing, as you say. There's a P wave pair, right. Let's call it a P wave pair, but let's not call it a P wave superconductor. And this P wave is a chiral P wave, or it's not PX plus IP wave here? It's not chiral. It's not chiral. It's chiral, I see. I mean, yeah, and it is P wave on even on the, this is also some kind of P wave. This is some particular representation uh, of the square lattice phase group and triangle lattice phase group, uh, which is odd in parity, but it doesn't break time reversal. Um, I'm sorry, this, this is a really naive question, but if you have, um, so you mentioned at the beginning that you could choose to pair, to kind of condense in the triplet channel as opposed you to the could. singlet channel. Um, yeah. Can you condense like in both of them in some, in some uh, like admixture and then, you know, you don't condense in the like orthogonal complement of that? And would that yeah. be useful for, yeah. I mean, the possibilities um, are endless. Everything you said is possible and you end up getting all kinds of states. Uh, you could get some kind of ferromagnet, you could get ferromagnets coexisting with Z2 spin liquids, you could get, uh, who knows, <laughs> spirals, spin spirals, you can get, uh, you know, pneumatics, spin pneumatics, so all of these things uh, you can get by different choices of condensing what you condense and pair. And yeah. the triplet you would expect to be more energetically favorable for the ferromagnetic rather than the antiferromagnetic that we've just. I analyzed, would guess right? that's the case. Yes, absolutely. That, yeah. That's a reasonable guess. Yes. Okay, cool. Yeah. yeah. Very interesting. Thanks. Yeah, so I, I'm just taking, you know, that's why I gave this physical picture on Monday. I'm just, we just think of this, what we want is a sea of singlet bonds. So it's sort of like you want to condense the singlet bonds. And that's kind of what we did by just putting qij equals a constant. So we condense the singlet bonds, but it's not really a condensate because these singlet bonds can only move by moving another bond out of the way. And and that fact that they have to move each other out of the way to move, uh, and they have to resonate, they can't just move on their own. That's what's encoded in the gauge symmetry. Uh, and we're going to see that when we look at the fluctuations more carefully. Um, I, I have a kind of naive question, I think. So uh, why do you say that there is no global U1 here? For example, like I could just like choose a constant rho um, in, in that gate symmetry and that would give me a global U1. So why, why is it? Yeah, that? but so, it's uh, it's part of a gate U1. I mean, there is, yeah, it's, you can always, yeah. I mean, it's, but it's not on its own. I mean, when I say that the global, when you say that there's a global symmetry, generally you mean that it's a global symmetry, uh, which is on its own, that if you try to gauge it, that's not a symmetry. I see, okay. Uh, that's just terminology. So here is, it's really part of, you have a, the global transformation is one of an infinite class of transformation. You're just making the gauge transformation site independent, but you can make it site dependent and it's, that's also a symmetry. Uh, and uh, our time dependent. Uh, and all of those symmetries are what make this thing, you know, it's, yeah. That's why your your boson number, the boson number SZs, you know, naively if, if there was a global symmetry, you would say the boson number uh, is a global symmetry. Okay, that's not quite SZ though. Uh, yeah, it wouldn't exactly apply to the hardcore system. Uh, that would end up being some strange type of superfluidity of the bosons, yeah. That's not there because there is no global symmetry. I mean, there is one global symmetry, but it's not the boson number symmetry, that's SZ, right? SZ commutes with the Hamiltonian. And as we saw here, SZ is, it's not S dagger, S up, S dagger up, S up, plus S dagger down, S down. If you put a plus sign here, that's the gauge transformation. And that's this gauge. If you put a minus sign here, that's an, that is a global symmetry. That's just the boson number symmetry. So this boson number symmetry 
has nothing to do with the gauge U1 gauge symmetry because the U1 gauge symmetry has a plus here, not a minus. Right. Okay. Yeah. I mean, so of all of these exotic phases, just understanding, you know, just understanding what symmetry is global, what symmetry is gauge, and how is that gauge symmetry realized? That's you know ninety percent of the work in understanding the structure of the phase. <laughs> I'm just trying to do that slowly via the simplest example I know of. I mean, the other approach is to find exactly solvable models, but then you have to be as smart as Kitev, but it also limits you on the range of models you can look at. These approaches are quite general. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. So let me just make sure. So the the conclusion is that given the Hamiltonian you start with, the square lattice, the mean field analysis doesn't provide really the ground state. And then you go to a triangular lattice and you claim that. No, I, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. What I said was I, if I do mean field theory in the square lattice, I haven't shown this yet. I get a perfectly sensible mean field solution, which is some variational estimate of the square lattice energy. Uh, what I then should have said more clearly, however, we'll find this mean field solution when you include fluctuation is not a Z to spin lemma. I haven't shown that why, but that's what we're going to find. That's the next thing we're going to see uh, at the very start of uh, lecture on Friday. So it means not stable. In the it is stable. It is stable. Well, ultimately, because of monopole, there's a very weak instability, but we're not certainly not going to get to that. Uh, but it is locally stable. But still, it's it's something else. It's not as it turns out to be U1 spin liquid, not a Z2 spin liquid. But on the triangular lattice, the Z2 spin liquid, the mean field ansatz will be a good candidate. Yes, state. yes, it will be. And is the frustration on the triangular lattice plays any role? Yes, the fact that there are in in this approach, the fact that there are uh, odd odd numbered rings is important. That's what makes the difference. So on any lattice, so here any if you go. You need an even number of steps to go around any plaquette. Uh, that's that gives you a slightly different theory. But if you have a theory where there you, are, uh, you can go around with odd numbered rings like the triangular or the kagome, uh, then it gives you a Z2. Honeycomb also won't work for the same reason. Honeycomb only has even numbered rings. Now you can make you can get Z2 spin liquid in the square line, at least in principle, uh, by adding interactions along the diagonal. Then, 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 then this particular theory can be made to be stable. But I'm not okay for simplicity. I'm not considering that. Thank you. I should have said not stable. I mean, it is stable even without the diagonal thing. It, it, it this particular theory realizing what is our favorite state right now, the Z2 state, the simplest spin liquid. All right, great. So uh, I'm sure we can continue the discussion tomorrow morning and uh, see you on Friday. Um, also, I, I realize that Monday is a holiday, it's the university holiday, so there won't be any class. Uh, yeah, so just a reminder about that. Okay, I'll see you tomorrow or Friday. Thank you. Thank you.